Hi, I'm Patrice. And I'm Adriana. And you're watching Poppin. Poppin stands for presenting our perspectives on Philly Youth News. We are a youth-led news show that highlights the positive things youth are doing in the city and youth perspectives on different issues. In our 23rd episode, we are focusing on environmental justice. When we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about the right that everyone, regardless of who you are, how much money you make, where you live, or what you look like, has the right to a clean and safe environment. Research shows that environmental hazards like high air pollution disproportionately affect the low-income communities of color. So it's no surprise that here in Philadelphia, one of America's poorest big cities, many groups are concerned about climate change and environmental justice. In this episode, we look at ways young people and their families are fighting for clean water in their schools, clean air in their communities, and access to quality land and healthy food. But first, we visit Temple University in Center City to interview people on their concerns about environment and climate change. Let's roll the clip. Hi, I'm Adriana. And I'm Patrice. And, and we're, we're from Poppin. And us and other Poppin producers are doing street interviews about environmental justice. Let's, Let's go, go check, check it out. out. What are some environmental issues you're most concerned about? Okay, so there's a lot, but my main ones are basically fracking because that's really bad, especially because we live in Pennsylvania and our water is going to be affected. Can you explain to the audience what fracking is? Okay, so fracking is basically drilling into the ground uh, underneath to get oil, but it also can disrupt like the ecosystem and it can taint the water, make it flammable. Um, also, what's happening in Flint with water and also California with the drought, uh, water is an, obviously an important resource that we all need and it's very sad when we might not have any. I would say air pollution is probably most important to me because I do suffer from asthma, so um, it's, not, it's not very um, popular, I guess you would say, among people. Like, they don't really know about air pollution. I mean, they know that air pollution is present, but they don't know the effects or, or how deeply they're affected by air pollution. There's actually freight trains that are full of this oil, and this oil is actually, like, when the trains drive by, it's actually polluting the air within uh, the city. And if you look at where these trains are driving through, it's actually most commonly, again, black and brown neighborhoods. I'm so excited to see, like, young people getting involved in, like, Black Lives Matter and things of that nature, but also understanding that, you know, like, the environment feeds into that system, like, that system, like, environmental racism, like, is something that we need to be involved in because it's impacting us the most. I feel like if I ever had to feed more than just myself, it would be really, really hard. I think it's very important that people that live in inner cities have access to healthier foods, especially black people, because, you know, we're at risk for things such as, like, high blood pressure and things like that. So if we have access to those healthier foods, perhaps that wouldn't be such a risk. What are some other environmental issues that you're most concerned about? I know we got to um, protect the ice cap. You know, the water, sea level's rising, it's getting hotter. Uh, weather's getting crazy, we're getting some wild hurricanes, a lot of rain. It's getting cold when it's supposed to be hot, it's hot when it's supposed to be cold. Do you feel the, the environment is more in danger this year than any year before? Yeah, considering uh, people and our government now um, are kind of neglecting the issues at hand, I definitely think there's a lot more at stake. Obama once said that climate change was a threat to our national security. So yesterday, Trump, he signed a executive order that repealed his action plans towards climate change. How do you feel about that? I think that's ridiculous. And he's just doing it in the interest of the, the economy, which is BS because there will be no economy when the world is completely dead. There's still a couple like politicians on the on the right that deny climate change, but it's because um, they're being lobbied by um, big corporations, um, including like big fossil fuel companies and oil companies um, that don't want to see regulations against like environmental policies, um, and that's the that's the reason why you have people like Trump. Uh, claiming that there needs to be more research done. I think it's important for the American government to take responsibility for the environment um, and to engage in ways that are as environmentally friendly as possible. We as citizens now have a duty to speak up to our government, to speak to power, and to you know let him be aware that we don't agree with him, that his, the people that he represents have a different opinion on the matter and that if he really represents us, then you know he has to listen to us and, and what, how we feel about it. Those street interviews showed that young people definitely are concerned about the environment. And those worried about clean air, they have a good reason to be concerned. Studies show that being exposed to air pollution and hazardous materials for an extended period of time causes cancer and asthma. 
In 2015, Philadelphia was ranked the third worst place in the U.S. for asthma sufferers to live, according to a report from the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Poor air quality is largely to blame. Up next, we visit Philly Thrive, a community organization that is fighting for clean air in Philadelphia. Let's check them out. Hey, I'm Nathaniel. And I'm Arlena. And we're from Poppin. In this segment, we turn to Philly Thrive, an environmental justice organization that's leading a Right to Breathe campaign. Earlier this month, we visited a Philly Thrive meeting to learn more about how they are organizing the fight for clean air in Philadelphia. And right now, we're here to see why Philly Thrive is protesting Wells Fargo and the Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery. Let's go check it out. Hi, today I'm here with Zaleika, one of the organizers of Philly Thrive. Would you mind explaining what's going on today? Yes, today we have a, a protest against Wells Fargo and their bad investments they make them towards our city. I'm here with Alexa, the Leadership Development Coordinator of Philly Thrives. Can you elaborate on your mission and your demands for Philly Thrives? Yeah. So Philly Thrive's goal is to unite Philadelphians for the right to breathe and win political support against toxic energy hub projects. So for us, the right to breathe means uh, health and safety over profit. At the community meeting, we asked young people what health and safety over profit means to them. That means that my health and my safety is worth more than you sitting on your profit, meaning your money. Wells Fargo uses that money to invest in things that harm the city of Philadelphia. They are funding the refinery in southwest Philadelphia, which is going to damage air quality even further. Right now, Philadelphia has the highest asthma, <laughs> asthma rate in the country, and they're about to make it worse. We wanted to know how the oil refinery personally affected young people from Philly Thrives. Uh, it infected my brother and my mom because they got asthma. And when I was walking my brother to school, he was saying he can't breathe. My brother has asthma. Um, the chemicals that come out of the oil refinery worsen my brother's asthma. And um, the chemicals that come out of the oil refinery causes cancer. The Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery is responsible for 72% of the toxic air emissions in Philadelphia. I am in a blast zone um, of the oil refinery. So a blast zone is um, like if the oil refinery blow up, my whole community and even further would die. So how does that make you feel to know that children being in this environment are affected by this on a daily basis? It made me upset because I see a lot of children and mainly in my neighborhood that's rushed to the hospital because of all these these people in Philly they they're sick they've got asthma they've got cancer and they're and the folks at the top the wealthy corporations the wealthy people are not helping everyday Americans and I'm trying to help change that that's what we're here to do today we're here to educate people and we're trying to change the future so that it's better for everybody here in Philly we already live with the consequences of the largest oil refinery on the East Coast in our city, and we do not want any more of that. So we believe we should have jobs in an economy that takes care of people and the planet. So why do you believe that the youth should be concerned about this issue? Because the youth is our future, and I believe that they should know what's going on with our environment. One of the demands on your website was to gain political support. How do you plan to do that? Well, right now we're working on doing town hall meetings and hopefully we let our voices be heard. By gathering information about what Philadelphians want for their energy future, we'll be able to, to build momentum and hopefully take that to city council to ask for real solutions to energy problems. We are calling on Philadelphians to get up to city council on April 6th and lobby for the city to divest those three billion taxpayer dollars from Wells Fargo Bank. On May 2nd, Philadelphia City Council voted to end their $2 billion contract with Wells Fargo. This is a step in the right direction, but the fight for clean air in Philly continues. I'm Marlena. I'm Zuleika. And, and that's, that's what's poppin'. poppin'. Wow, go ahead, Philly Thrive. Patrice, I live in South Philly, and I didn't even know that Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery is responsible for 72% of toxic air emissions in Philadelphia. That's right in my backyard. Whoa, 72% is a lot. I'm glad Philly Thrive is bringing people together to demand clean air. I agree, we all have the right to breathe clean air. Up next, we turn to another issue related to environmental justice, 
healthy food. We visit Rebel Ventures, a food coalition based in West Philly whose goal is to push healthy snack options in public schools. But first, Lex explain to them what food justice has to do with environmental justice. Food justice is such an important part of environmental justice because many times, access to good food is dependent on if you live in the right neighborhood. That doesn't seem fair. If your main source of food is school, then your school food should be healthy. Access for food should be a right for everyone. You're definitely right. I'm glad Rebel Ventures is working to make sure nutritious food is available for everyone. Let's see what's cooking. Hi, I'm Patrice from Poppin and I'm here with Tricia. We are here at the Center for Culinary Enterprises and I'm here to learn more about Rebel Ventures. Rebel Ventures is a social enterprise that's ran by high school students. Zaire, can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved with Rebel Ventures? Well, I'm sure you met my best friend, Tricia. We go to the same high school and I was like kind of looking for a job. So she brought me, in, she brought me into this and I came in, volunteered for about two weeks. And then next thing you know, I'm hired. At the beginning, I had to do two weeks of volunteering to see like if I was qualified for the job. And it was my choice if I wanted to stay or not. I'm Samira here with Jared, the coordinator from Rebel Ventures. So can you tell us a little bit about how Rebel Ventures started? Absolutely. So I was a teacher, a nutrition teacher uh, at Pepper Middle School in Southwest Philadelphia. And I asked my students one day, how would you create a healthier school? And they said, well, we don't have a lot of healthy snacks here, so we should just make healthy snacks for our school. And these are seventh and eighth graders, and uh, this was like the most engaging, effective classroom experience that I'd ever been a part of. Uh, unfortunately, Pepper Middle School closed. Also, the middle school students became high school students, so we had to figure out, okay, what are we going to do next? We were able to hire the high school students to work after school to start this business called Rebel Ventures that made healthy snacks. Can you tell us about your new breakfast product, Rebel Crumbles? Yeah, Rebel Crumbles is a breakfast cake that uh, is made with apples, uh, cinnamon, cranberries, and uh, a lot of grains. Uh, basically a lot of this uh, essential stuff that a young person would need to basically get them through their day. When our school district reached out to us to come up with a breakfast for the schools throughout Philadelphia, we um, started in February on Saturdays to come up with something that meet the criteria with the school district. So um, we've been experimenting for about a year now. We came up with the apple cranberry one and it finally went through and it met the criteria with the school district. So lately in Poppin, we've been learning about, you know, the food justice movement and, you know, why it's important for communities to have access to healthy foods. So where do you guys fit in in that movement? So justice, we think, really just means fairness. And that it's fair that everyone, kids, adults, everyone, we focus specifically on kids, has access to good food and food that they think is delicious. So like both nutritious and delicious. So in terms of fairness, we think it's fair that young people have good food, food that they want to eat, food that's nutritious, and we're going to make it available to as many people as possible. Can you tell us a little bit about how this program has impacted you? It impacted me because it made me become a better person and it made me like learn how to run a successful business because this business is very successful. It gave me more access on healthy foods and more healthy options and it's expanding my um, vocabulary on like the type of things that we can eat. What's next for Rebel Ventures? I would say what's next for Rebel Ventures is um, coming up with more products for, for the schools so they can have more access to healthy foods. We want to also hire more high school students so we can have more support in the kitchen and continue doing what we do best. I'm Patrice and I'm with Tricia. And, and that's, that's what's poppin'. That was good, don't it? I think that's such a cool way to fight for food justice. If you go to a public school in Philly, make sure to look out for Rebel Crumbles in your cafeteria one day. Next, we turn to another program working towards food justice. Viet Lead is a program in Philly and South Jersey that serves up Vietnamese culture and history through food, gardening, and workshops. Shimmy and Nate went to the celebration for the Lunar New Year in February to learn about their work and how it connects to food justice. Viet Lead focuses on the community aspect of food justice. 
which means that every community should have the right to be able to grow, sell, and eat healthy food. All this talk about food is making me hungry. I cannot wait to see this. What's up, you guys? I'm Nathaniel. And I'm Shumi. And we're here from Poppin'. We're here at South Philadelphia's Furnace High School to celebrate the Lunar New Year. This event is organized by Viet Le, and we're here to learn about their program and how they address food sovereignty and food justice. Let's go check it out. Hey, I'm here with Mimi, who's been here at the program for at least two years now. Can you tell us a little bit about what's happening here today? Um, so today is Vietnamese Tết, and Tết is also mean Lunar New Year in Vietnamese. And it's a traditional festival from a long time ago where we celebrate our Lunar New Year with uh, youth, children, and uh, elder. Basically, this uh, festival is a way to celebrate cultures and a, a way to celebrate our traditional cultures. So it kind of like brings us together as like a family, and I, that's the reason why I kind of joined this program. I'm here with Lon, the Food Sovereignty Director. Can you tell us a little bit about your job and what you do? Yes, so I direct our Food Sovereignty Program, and that's over in Jersey and also in Philly. Uh, and what that looks like, it looks like a couple different things. So in Jersey, we have a community garden. It's a half acre, it's called Resilient Roots. We work with elders and young people, high school and also grade school age youth. What we're doing in Philly right now is we're trying to get a garden because um, we believe that having a garden also means that is a way of uh, healing. It's a, it's a process of healing for elders since they suffer a lot from uh, BTSD, also trauma from war. So having our garden and know how to gardening is a way to heal, is a process of healing both physically and mentally. What is food justice to you? I think food justice is a way to connect back to food and I feel like food was is like a really key point to anybody's life and when it's talk, when it's like reference to justice I feel like that means that we should have control of our own food and be able to produce our own food without having any conflictions with like any institutions or around our city. We make workshops with our young people and our elders where we bring in um, folks, to, elders to teach our young people how to cook cultural foods and how to grow cultural vegetables. That's one of the ways that we have been kind of trying to bridge that intergenerational gap. I think a few years, a few years ago I didn't really do much and so I found this organization and I thought this was a way to give back to my community and not only that but to um, connect back to my Vietnamese culture because I kind of felt lost like with who I am as and I was kind of confused with like my identity. We have school year programming that meets twice a week. One that is in primarily Vietnamese and one that is in English and you know what we're doing in the workshops is really talking about how is the struggle and the struggle for the right to land here also connected to our people's history back in the homeland of Southeast Asia with uh, access to land in Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and um, you know the struggle during colonialism and how it's really tied to our present day conditions now. So we have a summer program, an intense summer boot camp called Some Our Roots, Summer Roots. And so folks can definitely come through to that. Joining this program kind of like made me open up a little bit, more than a lot actually. I just my heart grew because of this program. I want everyone else to experience what I have experienced in like just a year and a half. So that's why I put so much like me and the rest of like my, my team and like other people are put so much effort and time into like this festival. Thank you, Viet Lee, and I'm Shumi. And I'm Vina and, and that's, that's what's popping. <laughs>
We visit a community meeting at West Philly High School, school officials at Mastery Pickett Charter School, and organizers from Youth United for Change to learn about what is happening on the ground around clean water crisis in schools. Since the ongoing lead water crisis in Flint, Michigan, people across the country have had growing concerns about their water, including here in Philadelphia. It's a little known fact that in 1993, the Environmental Protection Agency warned the Philadelphia School District about the lead contamination in Philly schools. Today, more than one out of every 10 Philadelphia children have concerning levels of lead contamination. Youth United for Change, a youth leadership organization in Philly, started their fight for clean water access in Philadelphia schools in February 2015. When students reported being forced to buy water since there was no safe drinking water in school, YUC testified at City Hall and directly influenced the creation and passing of bills that require annual lead testing at all Philadelphia public schools and mandate schools to have one working water fountain for every 100 students. We visited YUC to learn more about their advocacy. Hi, I'm Shumi and I'm at Youth United for Change and we're here to talk about the struggle to get clean water access in schools and I'm here with Gaia. Uh, what have been some of your observations or uh, experience with water in your school? Um, sometimes students would want to go drink some water and um, it's usually hot and the water is not really clean and some of the schools don't really, don't really allow them to bring water bottles. What are some of why you see the men's referring to clean water? Um, well, there's actually two major demands. One, that when all the hydration stations get put into these schools, that the students are able to know um, what to do if there's a problem with the hydration station, like if there's a red light that comes on and it's not filtered, right? Um, to make sure that people keep up with those water fountains, like don't just put it in there and then leave it there and expect it to just be fine for the rest of the year. Um, and also the fact that more schools need to be able to bring water bottles um, in the school in order to fill, in order to use the hydration station. And if students are able to bring a bottle in the school, to keep them hydrated through the day, it's, it's, it's a little pointless. Being able to generate enough power and know who to speak that power to has really made a major impact in getting some of the things that we've been calling for. How have you been able to win some of your demands? Well, really, it's been a lot of hard work. Um, our students have really taken the time to investigate this issue and to put in the energy and the labor into analyzing the problems and bringing in some of their, their peers and, and doing that grassroots organizing so that our legislators, decision makers in the city aren't able to say that young people don't care about their schools or care about some of these issues that some might think are mundane, such as water access. Our students really care a lot and are representative of students around the city, and that's really important. We decided to look around in our own schools. Scion visited Mastery Charter Picket Campus to see what is being done to make sure that the water students are drinking is safe. What are the administrators and other staff members doing to ensure that the water that we're drinking is safe? Great question, Zion. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to have the best answer for you, but I'm going to give you the true answer. Um, I just became principal this past July. And so up until this moment, I have done nothing to ensure that the water is safe because it hasn't even crossed my mind as something to do. While I've been in this building for seven years and I've never once actually asked about the water in the building, I've only been principal since July. Uh, so there are two people that I directly supervise that uh, this would be one of their responsibilities, uh, which is our our building engineer and our um, assistant principal of operations. We talked to one of those people she supervises. Mr. Watt is the building engineer at Mastery Charter Picket Campus. You've been here one year. Can you tell us what the administration and the staff has been doing to ensure that the fountain water that these students are drinking is safe? We just did a um, backflow test to make sure the water that's coming from the city, there's nothing coming into this building. You said the backflow tests, tests for any type of contaminants. Does lead actually count for that? No, that would be like a separate testing. So you're not aware of any of the lead water tests that no. are going around? No, not at all. But um, it's something I will try to follow up on.
I do drink from our fountains. I don't drink from our bathrooms where it says don't drink the water. Because this is a part of a public charter school, do you think that this new policy that the school district is applying will apply to this school as well? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I didn't know about it. Uh, we are a public charter school, so my hope is that uh, because we are, we partner with the school district of Philadelphia with many things, um, including a lot of our policies, including professional development uh, and sharing resources. My hope is that we're public, we get public funding, that that same um, testing of the water would apply to us. I would certainly advocate for it if I knew who to contact. And what I would love from you guys is, who, who are the people that are in charge of this? Who can I reach out to to get representation for us as a charter school as well? Confusion about lead water testing isn't limited to one school. Poppin' Producers conducted a survey of students, teachers, and administrators at various schools. We found out that many students and staff were unaware of what is going on. We asked questions like, Do you drink the water at your school? and received answers like, If we can't drink sink water, why should we drink fountain water? They all come from the same pipes. It's warm and it doesn't taste good. Yes, we aren't offered any other things. Because I'd be thirsty. We also asked, Are you aware that 8% of 40 Philly public schools tested positive for lead water? No, but not surprised. After hearing reports of contaminated water at West Philly High School, which got a whole new building in 2012, Parents and community members demanded a meeting with school officials and the environmental director of the school district. We attended this meeting to interview those who showed up. So, Anthony, um, what brought you here today? Um, so I'm here because of the uh, the water crisis at West Philadelphia High. I worked in the building last year, um, and there were concerns about um, the pollution in the water before. I'm hearing reports students are like hitting me up telling me that, yeah, I didn't drink no water today because the water was brown. This school is fairly new, so for this situation to be going on, it's a fairly new precedent. So I wanted to make sure I found out and got as much information about the issue to pass on to the community and other parents as well. When our letters will come out of our house, we will contact us as parents to get our kids tested for the lead. Somewhere during a meeting, I heard, you know, one of you guys say that you were adding hydration stations in the schools. So are they in every school now or, you know, is it still a work in progress? We, we have hydration stations in about 95% of the schools. Um, and we committed to, to having three hydration stations in every school by uh, the end of the school year. And we're, um, we'll, be, we'll be done sooner than that. So we'll probably be done by the end of April. I understand that you guys test, you know, public school water for lead and other types of pollution, um, pollutants in the water. Um, do you guys also do that with um, charter schools? Because charter schools are technically public schools. We have tested the lead in water at several charter schools, primarily those that occupy school district of Philadelphia buildings. Um, but I am going to reach out to the uh, charter office and talk about this with them because you bring up a really good point that everybody is required to do this testing all schools should um, and I think that we need to make sure that that's consistent and I'm just asking as a community member and a parent of the kids here you know can we please set up a new standard a new precedent for communication amongst parents and, and, and staff here a new standard as far as how the information goes out to the community so us as parents can get the information if we can't make it out. With the information that you got today from the principal and all that, um, do you think that they know what they're talking about? Um, I think that they have like a, a, a hold on a lot of information, but they don't know how to make it accessible to community members because they don't talk to community members. So tell me, Chris, why should the children in the school district care about the water? You know, because I feel like as complicated as the adults are trying to make this problem, when you just break it down to the simple ingredients, you know, it's a building with water that could possibly be bad. And as human beings, our, our body is majority water. So when you think about and just in simplistic ingredients, ingredients and put it in that form, I think you can kind of see how these things just going into a human body, how they could be detrimental. Moving forward. We hope that all schools, public, private, and charter, will be more proactive around ensuring access to clean water. In the meantime, I'm Tyrone. And I'm Chris. And, and that's, that's what's poppin'. poppin'. To find out more about this issue, you can visit the following website and organizations. 
This has me side-eyeing the water at my school. Just like clean air and healthy food, we need clean water. This makes me want to work with the organizations we just saw and schedule a meeting with my principal now. I'm a little too nervous to do that, but I'm going to check with my mom to see if she wants to talk to the school about it. That sounds like a good idea. Next up, we have the Green Building Track Vocational Program at Youth Build, an alternative high school in North Philly. The Green Building Track Vocational Program equips youth with the knowledge and skills to enter the green economy through construction. This program has teamed up with the company Solar States to install solar energy panels in the community. I guess if we want a sustainable planet, we should learn how to build it. I want to check this out. How you guys doing? My name is Nick from Poppin. We're here with George Jenkins over here at Greenville Vocational Training, which is one of seven programs they have at Youth Build. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, the Green Vocational Program training is and what you guys do here? One of the main things that we try and do here is to definitely work with the youth and educate them on the green revolution that's taking place all over our country. Because of all of the different weather patterns going on, um, global warming happening, and a lot of different things that are going on across the country, as some of my students will tell you, uh, like the sea levels rising, uh, what we thought was really good was to be able to educate everybody here on the East Coast as well as educate our students and get them a lot of the information about green building so they can be properly informed and also um, get the next jobs that are going to be in this sort of what we call a green revolution here on the East Coast. Inside the wall we use yeah, we spray the insulation inside this hole. So can you tell me uh, what brought you to this program? Um, actually, I was actually trying to finish school and I, I am very interested in construction so I picked Green Building and as I got in Green Building I learned a lot about the Clean Air Council and why we should be worried about our environment like the earth and we should take care of it. I learned a lot about like solar panels and why we really need them to save energy. Green Building is construction 100%. It is just you do it in the way where you design, install and have no wasted building products ever. Can you tell us what your favorite part about the program is? My favorite part about the program is um, the way they teach us in this, um, and, and how we so hands on with the program. And it's not just book work and standing and sitting in class. We actually come to a work site, um, learn different tools, learn different power tools. Greenbird not only about construction, it's more so about like energy. You learn about different stuff that you can do at home, about like washing clothes. You can actually save energy by washing clothes with cold water. A lot of people don't do that. Most people don't know the power you saving from uh, the solar panels, go into the inverter box, and you can get back from Pico as a check. Copper comes from the earth, and we try and prevent more of damage getting to the earth. We found the uh, green away using Plex. Uh, the blue is for cold, and the red is for hot. Can you tell us a little bit about how um, Greenville has impacted your own personal life? It opened up my eyes for a lot of things, like how it was a lot of pollution in the air and it's bad for our, uh, our health. We always need to recycle because it can, it can um, make into a new, anything new, a new item. I think young people should actually pay attention to like what's going around an environment like they need to learn about global warming, what's starting to happen with us, the weather is changing. They need to learn how to keep out here clean because if they don't keep out here clean, we all going to be wiped away. The best Green Bell teacher ever, man. You already know. George Jenkins, you already know. Like, come to Youth Bell. I'm Nick. I'm Marquise. And I'm Shalia. And, and that's, that's what's poppin'. poppin'. Sometimes I feel like there isn't a place for me in the green energy movement. So I'm glad there are programs where youth like me can learn skills for the green industry. Many people don't realize this, but people of color and low-income people have historically been on the front lines of the fight for environmental justice. Although at the time, movements like the Black Panthers Breakfast Programs and the Health Revolutionary Unity Movement led by the Young Lords were not considered part of the Green Movement, at their core, these programs tie into environmental justice. Indigenous people in the Americas have always been leaders in the struggle for environmental justice. In our final segment of our 23rd episode, we turn to the Dakota Access Pipeline, where the Sioux Tribe in North Dakota are struggling to protect their land and water. Obama and Trump administrations have made this issue very complicated, but poppin' producers Nathaniel and Josh are here too. Break it down! Hey, I'm Nathaniel. And I'm Joshua. And you're watching Breaking It Down. 
What $3.7 billion project will cover 1,172 miles, transfer 470,000 barrels of oil each day, and ignite a national outcry among environmental justice and the rights of indigenous people? If you guessed the Dakota Access Pipeline, you're correct. The Dakota Access Pipeline, also known as DAPL, is an underground pipeline transporting crude oil from North Dakota through South Dakota and Iowa to Illinois. Crude oil is unrefined oil that can be found deep in the ground. Once refined, we use the oil to perform functions like fueling cars and heating homes. Supporters of DAPL argue that building this pipeline makes us less dependent on foreign oil. They also argue that it will create an abundant amount of new jobs for the economy and increase the tax revenue for local and state economies. The increased revenue would improve schools, roads, and emergency services in those areas, supporters say. But opponents of DAPL who have dubbed themselves water protectors fear the effects of an oil spill might have on their main water source. There have been many cases of pipelines breaking down and causing oil spills to pollute the soil and water. Water protectors argue that land, natural resources, and public health are more important than economic incentives. A pipeline-related incident is considered significant when there is fatality or injury requiring inpatient hospitalization. This is why the people of Bismarck, North Dakota, which is a predominantly white community, didn't want this pipeline running through their neighborhood. The company responded to their backlash and rerouted the pipeline so that it directly impacts another community, Native Americans from the Sioux tribe, at the Standing Rock Reservation. This decision to move an environmental hazard away from a white, privileged community to a more marginalized community of color is a common trend known as environmental racism. And that's why this issue is a matter of environmental justice. For many months, Native communities led protests against the construction of DAPL. The Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North Dakota has sued the company Energy Transfer Partners, which has already damaged sacred burial grounds, according to the Sioux Tribe leadership. Along with the Standing Rock Sioux, Hundreds of other tribes and concerned Americans marched and camped out near the construction site in solidarity to block further construction. Peaceful demonstrators were arrested and many more were harassed by officers, attacked by dogs, mace, beaten with batons, and even shot with rubber bullets. It was reported that in the U.S., taxpayers spent $22.3 million in total for policing against protesters. The peaceful protesters saw a small victory in November 2016 when the Obama administration put a hold on the construction to look for more alternative routes. But Kelsey Warren, CEO of Pipeline Developer Energy Transfer Partners, told the Associated Press rerouting was not an option. At this point, the Army Corps were called in to protect the protesters in Pipeline from opposing forces. But on January 24, 2017, the new Trump administration used an executive order to continue the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. This wasn't a surprise since Trump invested between half a million to a million dollars into energy transfer partners and benefited more than 100000 in donation from the company's CEO, Kelsey Warren, during his presidential campaign. But Trump argues that his support of the pipeline quote has nothing to do with his personal investments and everything to do with promoting policies that benefit all Americans. With the executive order, occupants of the reservation were uprooted to make room for the pipeline, but they did not go so easily. Dumb water protectors were reported to set fire to the campgrounds before clearing out as a final act of protest on the soon-to-be Dapple land, which is expected to be finished in the spring of 2017. Sioux tribes have continued to file lawsuits against energy transfer partners and speak out. Chairman of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, Dave Archambault, said the opportunity to build awareness started at Standing Rock and is spreading out to other areas of the United States. Now, across the country, and even entire cities are boycotting banks and corporations that invest in the Dakota Access Pipeline. Here at Poppin, we support the indigenous community and water protectors who continue to demand water is life and people over profit. So, which side are you on? Thanks Josh and Nathaniel for breaking down the Dakota Access Pipeline controversy and resistance. This episode has highlighted several organizations and campaigns fighting for environmental justice, but there are so many more. We encourage you to explore the organizations and campaigns in your community and get involved. 
This is especially important now because the Environmental Protection Agency and its policies to reduce climate change are under attack by the Trump administration. This means that corporations and power plants will be able to pollute our environment more with less government regulations. It's on us to pressure our government officials and corporations like Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery to ensure our environment is safe. The fight for environmental justice is a fight we can win if we stay informed and work together to demand a healthy planet. Well, that concludes our 23rd episode about environmental justice. Remember to connect with us online and share your feedback and questions about this episode. Thanks for tuning in. Once again, I'm Adriana. And I'm Patrice. And that's what's poppin'.